Welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church. Scripture tells us that better is one day in the house of the Lord than a thousand elsewhere. So we are glad that you have joined us. If you'd like to sing along, you're going to find the words on the screen. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to live so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. And I'm going to work so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to pray so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to pray so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to sing, I'm going to sing so God can use me anywhere, Lord, anytime. I'm going to sing, I'm going to sing so God can use me. Just about any time. Welcome to this joyful time of worship here at First Presbyterian Church. Whether you are worshiping with us on Sunday morning or later in the week when it is convenient for you, we are glad that you have chosen to spend this time in worship with us. It is God's Holy Spirit that unites us as we worship from our separate locations. Beginning today, we will be collecting food for Knock Out Hunger. We will be collecting non-perishable food items or a monetary donation to help stock the food bank of the Virginia Peninsula. Donations can be brought to the church during office hours, Monday through Friday, 10 to 4. We have another volunteer opportunity if you wish to help people. Same, so all may eat. A mobile food pantry is looking for volunteers to help package, load, and deliver bags of food to those who are food insecure. You may call the church office for more details. Help needs your help. On Saturday morning at 9 a.m., they will be hosting a work day to help clean up the grounds of their brand new day center. Lunch will be provided, but you are asked to bring your own work gloves, hedge trimmers, and yard tools to help get the job done quickly. Friends, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Please join me in the call to worship. From near and far we gather. The house of God is our home. Here, we are no longer strangers. In the body of Christ, we are made one. Come into the presence of the Most High God. We come with songs of praise and shouts of thanksgiving. Let us worship God. What lies ahead may be unknown as I brave the unseen road. God, go with me. Every hidden sack. 
sacrifice through the watches of the night. God, go with me. Through it all I know I am not alone. crashing waves no fear when the cost is great no fear in the midnight hour you've given me a spirit of power no fear in the crashing waves no fear when the cost is great no fear in the midnight hour you've given me a spirit of turn to our scripture reading today, I'd like to inform you that today will be the final pre-recorded service that we will offer. Now that our sanctuary is open and we are able to gather, I would like to invite you to join us for in-person worship. If you are still most comfortable worshiping from home, we will continue to offer the live stream on Facebook Live each Sunday morning at 10 a.m. You do not have to have a Facebook account to access that. It stays on the Facebook page. You can watch it at any time of the week by clicking the Facebook logo on the church website. This pre-recorded service was thought that it would happen for only a few weeks. As you know, the world unfolded differently than planned. This service could not have happened without the hands and hearts of so many. And I offer my deepest gratitude to our tech AV sound crews who have done our service each week, as well as the many liturgists, singers, readers, and volunteers who showed up to recording sessions to offer this worship service. In addition, we've had beautiful set and table decorations with our liturgical art team, all to enhance our worship. Please join us each week live 
or on Facebook Live. Thank you. Today's scripture reading comes from the Old Testament. It is the story of David and Goliath, and I'm reading selected verses from 1 Samuel chapter 17. Listen to the word of the Lord. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armored with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. He had greaves of bronze on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went with him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, Today I defy the ranks of Israel. Give me a man that we might fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. David rose early in the morning, left someone in charge of the sheep, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the ranks, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with him. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth. And if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, The Lord who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will save me from the hand of Goliath. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord go with you. Saul clothed David with his armor. He put a bronze helmet on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail. David strapped Saul's sword over the armor, and he tried in vain to walk, for he was not used to them. Then David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these. So David removed them. Then he took his staff in his hand 
and chose five smooth stones from the wadi and put them in his shepherd's bag in the pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to Goliath. Goliath came on and drew near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. When Goliath looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And Goliath cursed David and his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. But David said, You come to me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hand. When Goliath drew nearer to meet David, David ran and quickly towards the battle line went to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in the bag, took out a stone, slung it, and struck Goliath on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, striking down Goliath and killing him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's story has to do with overcoming great obstacles. The story of David and Goliath is probably familiar to some of you. The armies of Israel and Philistine were ready to do battle. The Philistines sent out Goliath, a giant of a man to fight, while Israel sent out David, a small shepherd boy. The battle seemed over before it even began. Can't you just picture it? Goliath was brash and loud. Nobody argued with him. Why would they? He was bigger and meaner and nastier than anyone around. His appearance made people tremble with fright. He was over nine feet tall, wore a bronze helmet and a coat of armor weighing approximately 125 pounds. On his timber-like legs, he wore coatings of armor as well. He carried a bronze javelin slung over his back, whose iron point alone weighed 15 pounds. They called him a champion. His name, Goliath, brought goosebumps to the Israelite army. Every day for weeks, Goliath taunted Saul's army. Each morning, the Israelites would line up in military formation until they heard the thundering voice of Goliath taunting them. At the sound of his words, they fled to the safety of their tents. Then one day, a young boy in his teens happened to be visiting his older brothers who were soldiers in the army. And the next thing we know, that young boy, David, is volunteering to head off into battle to fight this giant. He is confident that the God who has saved him from bears and lions will protect him once again. He's not confident in his own abilities, but confident in God's ability to use him to achieve desired results. He puts on the traditional arm, armor for battle, but it is simply too big and heavy. 
Its bulky nature prevents him from even being able to walk. The tools of war are too large and too heavy for this young shepherd. That was not his style. That was not the equipment he was used to. So he picks up his stones and heads toward the battlefield. Taking only his slingshot, he approaches the giant, and the unthinkable happens. In spite of the differences in size, in spite of the fact that his equipment seemed so inadequate, in spite of all the obstacles he faced, David came out of the battle victorious. He overcame all the obstacles in his path. David understood that to meet this challenge, he would have to do his very best and leave the rest to God. He allowed God to use him even when it seemed he was not at all equipped for the job. He simply trusted in the Lord. He trusted God to equip him in such a way that the obstacles would be overcome. It's almost as if David knew it was time for a new way of thinking. It was time for someone to go against the rules, to prove the establishment wrong. David proved that bigger is not always better, that stronger does not equal more powerful, and that the best equipment does not guarantee victory. He proved that it pays to think in new ways. No one in their right mind would have ever sent him into battle alone with only a slingshot and a hope for the best. But he proved that sometimes the best way to solve a problem is by ignoring the obstacles, trusting in God, following your gut, and trying something new. He was probably one of the first examples of thinking outside the box, of not being constrained to tradition, of not being led by, we've always done it that way. He showed the importance of not letting your vision for the future be limited by your knowledge of the past. I think David also made one very important move that we can learn from. He knew the obstacles in his way, yet he also knew the task that needed to be accomplished. He knew the job to be done, and he took the tools that he knew and applied them in new ways. He knew he was proficient with some pebbles and a slingshot, but nobody ever thought that a few small stones would be enough for a battle with a giant. But he trusted in God to help him use the talents he had and apply them in a new setting. He knew what he was good at, and he knew what God was calling him to do. So he did what he was good at to the best of his ability, even when it seemed like his talent would not take him very far. And he ended up victorious, all because he was able to take what he knew and applied it in new ways. So if David can overcome the obstacles in his way, what obstacles can we overcome? What challenges does the church of Jesus Christ need to overcome? This seems like a constant topic of conversation in my circles. I hang out with a lot of pastors from churches large and small, in cities and towns from all over, and the constant question is, what can, we done, what can be done to set up the church for success in the future? What leadership skills do we need in our bag of tricks? How do we do ministry in the culture of the 21st century, which changes quicker than we can grasp? How do we communicate what the church does and how faith can impact the life of an individual or a family when people don't even know what we're talking about. What have we learned from this past strange year about what is really important and about what we value? 
How adaptable have we shown ourselves to be? These and so many other questions are at the heart of so many discussions with colleagues and peers. The headlines and statistics recently have not read in our favor. Mainline Christianity is no longer the normal, no longer the majority. Many people identify as spiritual, but not religious. Church membership trends are on the decline. There are so many demands on people's time that they simply don't make the time to invest in a church home, in a community of faith, in a loving congregation. In fact, research shows that the religious demographic that is growing the fastest in America is the nuns, as in, are you Episcopalian, Methodist, Catholic, or none of the above? Are you Jewish, Protestant, Buddhist, or none of the above? The nuns, N-O-N-E-S, are the fastest growing sector of our population. That presents a major challenge. That reality might seem like a mighty obstacle. It can make us tremble in fear and hide in our tents, not knowing what to do. Or we can take a cue from David, his pebbles, his slingshot, and most importantly, his belief that God would lead him to creative approaches and new solutions. I hope we are inspired by stories of faithful people of the past overcoming great obstacles. I will not deny that we face obstacles every day. And looking at them may lead to many, many questions and doubts. But I hope we take a cue from young David by not letting the obstacles slow our desire to think in new ways and try new things. What are the obstacles? First, identify them. This congregation has so many gifts and talents and so much potential to serve the people of God with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love that I know you can overcome obstacles. How can you learn from David's actions and apply what you do well to new circumstances and new ways of thinking? David showed that sometimes great obstacles stand in our way, but he also proved that with trust in God, any obstacles, even the biggest ones, can be overcome in ways we never imagined. Amen. I invite you to join me as we go to God for a moment of prayer, praying not only for ourselves, but for the needs of the world around us. Let us pray. Holy and merciful God, as we come here today to bring you honor and glory and praise, we pause to join our hearts together in prayer and bring our concerns to you. You know the worries that are silent on our hearts, the friends, family, and neighbors that we lift before you today. We bring you our concerns for ourselves and for the world around us, knowing that in you, we find ultimate hope, healing, and peace for all that troubles us. We pray today for our loved ones, for those near and far, for those we love and hold dear, we ask your presence. Be with those we know who are digesting the news of a troubling diagnosis, waiting on tests and their results. Be with those who are dodging life's curveballs, with those who are frustrated by the pace of recovery and those who fear what tomorrow may hold. Hear the prayers and tears of all who suffer. Today we pray for all who are in need of your presence and your grace. Use us as your church to bring calm where there is anxiety, comfort to places of pain, unity to places of division, and grace where it is needed most. 
Use us to show this world who you are and what you call your people to do. Make us instruments of your love and grace. We pray also today for your church. There is much work for us to do, many people for us to reach, individuals who long for your love and grace. Allow new ideas to be born and take root. Empower us to continue our many ministries with energy and enthusiasm, with courage and conviction, allowing all whom we meet to know you through our efforts. We are so thankful that you hear us as we pray, whether eloquent or simple, whether at a shout or at a whisper, whether through tears of pain, rages of anger or bursts of joy, we know you listen, even when we don't know what to say, even when we are timid in your presence. We know that you are our God and we are your people. And so we pray with confidence in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God's good hands have richly blessed us in numerous ways. So let us continue our worship by dedicating today's tithes and offerings. throughout my history Your faithfulness has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your good all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all over my life. Help me remember when I'm weak. come, but fear will leave. You lead my heart to victory. You are my strength, and you always will be. And I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my empty grave. The evidence is endless. All my sins rolled away because of you, oh Jesus. See the cross, the empty grave. The evidence is my life. 
my life. So why should I fear when the evidence is here? Why should I fear when the evidence is clear? Let us pray. Holy God, by the giving of today's tithes and offerings, may we remember your generosity toward us and be inspired to give back to you. May those in need be blessed by these gifts as we strive to use them to share your grace in all we do. Amen. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. into God's good world, into the joy of this new week, allowing God to guide your feet in love and service, sharing grace to your neighbors. And may the love of our Savior Jesus Christ be with us all, now and forever. Amen. Amen.